I wish to thank, first of all, uh, uh, Roberto Gambari and the Department of Life Sciences and Biotechnology for this kind invitation. It's always a great, great pleasure to come here in Ferrara and uh, meet again uh, very nice uh, friends uh, and, uh, and colleagues. Okay. Uh, so my seminar will be uh, divided into, into two parts. The first part, the first part on how to repair the genetic defect of cystic fibrosis patients with a minimal background since the cystic fibrosis as a model disease is quite well known uh, within also the students, the postdoc and so forth. And the second part will be on the anti-inflammatory approaches for CF lung disease. I will uh, make partly uh, an overview of the milestones reached in the international field of cystic fibrosis and partly on the results obtained with the help of uh, my nice colleagues and collaborators at the Laboratory of Molecular Pathology at the University Hospital of Verona and with many colleagues outside the lab, first of all colleagues at the uh, University of uh, Ferrara. So cystic fibrosis, just to recall you very briefly and quickly, is a genetic disease, autosomy recessive disease that affects the epithelia and the exocrine glands of several organs. Uh, here, the, these are recalled here, the lung, the sweat gland, uh, the, the liver, the exocrine pancreas, the intestine, and the male reproductive apparatus. But uh, uh, among these organs, uh, uh, lung disease uh, is what heavily affects uh, the life expectancy and the life quality of patients affected by cystic fibrosis. As you can see from this uh, uh, section, you can see that uh, you have uh, the bronchi filled with a huge amount of neutrophils, and this was a, a surgical uh, from a three months old infant with cystic fibrosis. So uh, the, the major challenge is the lung disease and uh, so the major part of my seminar will be on the uh, lung pathology. Uh, so uh, the, since the 1938 uh, when cystic fibrosis was discovered in, in New York City uh, by Dr. Anderson, uh, the, the genetic defect was really a mystery up to the beginning of the uh, 1980, when several groups were working to find the genetic defect of, uh, of this disease. And the light at the end of the tunnel uh, came in 1989, when uh, a consortium of three strong North American labs uh, discovered the cystic fibrosis gene. The gene is a, uh, let's say, a large gene, 250 kilobases, uh, and it's organized in 27 exons. And the gene encodes uh, um, an integral membrane protein that is uh, located mainly in the apical membrane of, of the epithelia of the uh, affected organs. Uh, it's constituted by two membrane-spanning domains, MSD1 and 2, with uh, 12 alpha helices and three globular domains. Two of these uh, domains uh, bind ATP and these are the nucleotide binding domain 1 and 2 and a third globular uh, intracellular domain called the R or regulatory domain contains several serines and threonines with consensus sequences from protein kinase A which activates uh, the function of the channel, and the function of the channel can be activated also by protein kinase C, as we found many years ago uh, in uh, Verona. So, uh, CFTR protein is, first of all, a chloride channel, a chloride transporter. Um, some other small molecules could be transported by CFTR, for instance, by carbonate. Uh, but on that, there is always um, still now a discussion Many other molecules were claimed but not confirmed. So first of all, CFTR is a chloride transporter that works in an uh, off-on uh, status, so should be activated in, uh, in its uh, uh, job. And going back to the lung, uh, CFTR protein 
is located on the apical membrane of the uh, bronchial epithelial cells that, that line the surface of the bronchi. Let's see that on top of this we have the lumen of the bronchi and also in the submucosal glands that produce the glycoprotein constituted the respiratory mucus. And in this position, uh, it's mainly in the ciliated cells of the bronchial epithelial cells, uh, in this position, the transport of chloride mediated by CFTR protein regulates sodium transport by parallel pathways and the amount of water in the airway surface liquid here. So what happens in cystic fibrosis? We have less water in the airway surface liquid. The, uh, the airway surface liquid is more viscous and uh, the mucociliary clearance, uh, that is the, uh, the main basic innate defense mechanism against uh, uh, microorganisms in, in the lung, is reduced. So, uh, the increased viscosity of the airway surface liquid uh, induces early onset inflammation. This, this is more or less the mechanism that is uh, consolidated on that and favors uh, the infection, recurrent infection, bacterial infection with staph A, Haemophilus and at the end a chronic colonization with the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Next, please. So, incredibly, incredibly, uh, more than 200 disease-causing mutations have been discovered in the uh, CF, uh, in the CF gene. So, question uh, just after, a few years after the discovery of the gene was, uh, how can we repair so many gene mutations? So, uh, the magic answer, uh, we thought to, to uh, to have the magic answer by replacing the defective CFTR gene in the airway cells of, uh, of the lung of cystic fibrosis patients, introducing the wild type, the correct CFTR gene, uh, delivering uh, the, the correct gene with the different vectors derived from, uh, for instance, adenoviruses, uh, uh, from parvo-associated adeno um, adeno parvoviruses, lentiviruses, or non-viral vectors such as liposomes of different, uh, of different uh, uh, formulations. Uh, so, the, from the bench of the biotechnologists producing these vectors, uh, very rapidly we switched on the, uh, the bedside to, to the patients. So many patients were recruited and uh, subjected to clinical trials uh, where these vectors were delivered in the airways by bronchoscopy or by aerosol in different, in different ways. So uh, this is uh, the, the situation in 1995. Uh, the next one, what we um, concluded is that unfortunately this way of repairing the cystic fibrosis defect uh, have problems of efficiency, first of all, and secondly, of safety. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, very low efficiency of gene transfer in differentiated airway cells, low efficiency of transport of the gene from the plasma membrane to the nucleus, this in particular for non-viral vectors, Sometimes the shutoff of the expression of the transgene or the gene transfected, uh, a dose-dependent inflammatory response, an activation of CTR response due to expression of residual viral proteins, difficult to shut off completely any trace of viral proteins with viral vectors, and reduce the efficiency of repeat administration due to humoral response. So. Um, why, for instance, we were taking viruses, uh, usually infecting the airway tract, let's say adenoviruses, causing bronchitis or, or pneumonia or something like that, and we just uh, made a replication defective vector, but the capsid, the, the, the structure uh, for, the, for the vector was substantially the same. 
why they are not efficient in transferring the gene. What we did is a, a strange uh, pathway. Uh, I mean, all, all the groups working on, on, this, uh, on this approach of um, uh, gene transfer. That was to test first the vectors in the patients, then finding that they are not efficient, and then asking why. And the point is that, uh, for instance, here's the example of one of these vectors, the adenovirus uh, type 2.5. In, in this case, uh, uh, these viruses uh, uh, bind and internalize with three different uh, receptors. One of them has been discovered by our group in Verona many years ago. But these three kind of receptors are not expressed on the apical membrane of the polarized cell on the surface of the lumen of the bronchi, but they are expressed on the basolateral membrane. So the vectors cannot access the, the, the receptors and internalize and transfer efficiency, efficiently the gene. So uh, now the scenario is, uh, is going to move very fast, uh, more than uh, uh, gene replacing. We are talking of uh, uh, gene editing, and this is, uh, we are more or less at the infancy in cystic fibrosis for, for this technology, and uh, we hope that we will uh, give uh, many promises, promises and results. But if we cannot uh, replace or edit the gene, what we can do is to try to work on the protein, the product of the gene. And uh, we, today we know that uh, uh, many of the mutations of the gene, uh, we know how they cause a molecular defect of the protein. For instance, uh, nonsense mutations like these uh, result in no synthesis of, of the CFTR protein, and we call it this uh, class one defects, uh, no protein. In other cases, uh, the most common mutation affecting from 50 to 70 percent of, of the CF patients, the f 58 del uh, mutation, uh, have a problem of misfolding of uh, uh, incomplete glycosylation, the protein does not reach the apical membrane of the epithelial cells and is degraded by a complex of quality control uh, proteasome. Uh, so this is called no traffic or class two defect. In other cases, uh, uh, the protein is well glycosylated, reaches the apical membrane, but does not open, does not transport chloride. And we call this a class three defect where we have no function of the protein. In other cases, the protein is, uh, is working, is transporting chloride, but, uh, the, for instance, the arginines in the alpha helices of the poor part of the protein are changed, uh, so the, the conductance of chloride is reduced in efficiency, and so the amount of chloride is, uh, is less transported and the, we have less function. Uh, class 5 defects, uh, they are more, mostly defects uh, of uh, aberrant splicing, so the amount of transcript uh, is, um, the, of normal transcript, is very, very low, and it, as a result, you have uh, a very little amount of, uh, of protein. The protein is perfectly uh, mature and on the apical membrane, but we have very, very low amount of protein. And then, interesting, the class 6 uh, defect, uh, is when the protein has a very short half-life uh, on the apical membrane. So uh, we say that uh, the, um, the protein is uh, less stable, and that is uh, in class six defects. Uh, in uh, the cystic fibrosis language, in the, I mean the jargon, uh, we say that uh, the molecules that uh, wish to correct the trafficking defects are called correctors. So I will talk of correctors later on. And uh, on the other side, the molecules that uh, want to activate the function of CFTR are called, uh, in our jargon, potentiators. Okay. Um, to, in order to find the new molecules uh, uh, with the characteristics of correctors or potentiators, 
you should uh, have uh, libraries, uh, gen in general libraries of 100,000 uh, uh, chemical uh, molecules, and you should have a very rapid way to screen that, uh, in our case, that they are able to restore a chloride transport function in epithelial cells. So it's not a very uh, simple uh, and uh, simple screening. Uh, the assay that are utilizing this kind of uh, high throughput screening are more or less three. Uh, this one, uh, they are all um, fluorescent based methods in uh, epithelial cells, all in epithelial cells. Uh, one assay is an assay that uh, is based on membrane potential sensitive probe, and this uh, one has, has been proposed by, by my lab many years ago. The second one is uh, the development of chloride-sensitive organic probes that has been developed by my maestro, Alan Workman, at the University of California, San Francisco, several years ago. And the third method is uh, the development of a, a yellow fluorescent protein made very sensitive to the collisional quenching uh, pro um, produced by halides, I mean chloride, iodide. And, uh, and so forth, and this has been developed also by Alan Bergman in collaboration with uh, uh, Luis Galietta from uh, Genova, so uh, quite a relevant Italian contribution to, to these uh, tools. Uh, next one. So if we look, for instance, at uh, class one defects, those defects that are usually produced by nonsense mutations, uh, that is a relevant problem. For instance, in Israel, W1282X uh, mutation is very, very frequent and uh, means uh, something like 50 to 60 percent of CF chromosomes in Israel. For instance, R1162X is more or less 10 percent of the uh, CF chromosomes in northeastern Italy, in Veneto, Trentino, and so forth. What has been proposed uh, some years ago was to uh, try uh, aminoglycoside antibiotics to restore uh, the premature stop codon mutations in CT fibrosis. So uh, this was a natural medicine paper, uh, but it, it was a little bit strange since uh, CT fibrosis patients uh, had a lot of uh, kilograms of gentamicin and tobramycin for their respiratory infections. But anyway, the, the, the idea was very interesting. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a lot of work on that. Uh, the problem is that if you want to take gentamicin or tobramycin every day to correct your nonsense uh, mutation of the CFTR gene, after a few years, uh, you have uh, inner ear loss. And uh, secondly, more importantly, you have a kidney disease uh, leading to a kidney insufficiency. Therefore, what uh, was done by PTC Therapeutics was to develop another molecule with the same uh, function without this uh, toxicity. And the molecule is Atalurin. Uh, I will, uh, that there have been um, clinical trials, phase two, phase three, in cystic fibrosis with atelurin, and uh, to cut a 10 years long story short, um, atelurin does not work for cystic fibrosis patients with nonsense mutation. Could be excellent for, let's say, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy or, or other genetic diseases, but not for uh, cystic fibrosis. So uh, this field of nonsense mutation is wide open, uh, very important, very relevant. Uh, people with ideas should go ahead. And I just uh, wish to mention uh, this uh, nice screening essay that has been set up by Monica Borgatti and uh, her colleagues um, to, uh, that could be applied to CF and to other genetic diseases, so if you need more details, ask Monica on this essay. Then the, uh, the major problem is uh, class 2 mutations and again class 3 mutations, more or less 75-80% uh, of cystic fibrosis patients. And uh, what m um, reached the major milestones uh, is uh, a vertex pharmaceutical 
a biotech company from California uh, with a lot of money from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation or from the USA that uh, started with high throughput screening. They um, utilized the modification of the assay we proposed uh, many years ago with band by potential probes. The next one. And this is the first results, VX770, this is the uh, structure of this molecule that has been screened for class 3 defects. And uh, this molecule that can be uh, taken by, by pills is really excellent. I mean, the result in the patients with G551D uh, mutation are really striking. The lung function uh, increases very soon by an average of 10%, which is really, really um, uh, a lot. Uh, the problem uh, here, it's not a problem, it's uh, just a limitation, is over here. Only 4-5% of cystic fibrosis patients. The next, uh, uh, this is the second great discovery of uh, Vertex Pharmaceutical. It's VX809, sorry for these uh, uh, numbers. Uh, this is the structure of the molecule. And uh, if you look at the results of uh, VX809 as a single uh, drug in cystic fibrosis patient with the most common a mutation of the, the deletion of the phenylalanine in position 508 of the polypeptide chain, the results are not really exciting. I mean, uh, there is a little bit of uh, improvement of lung function. There is a lot of variability. So VX809 is not enough. So the strategy was um, uh, straightforward. We have an excellent uh, uh, potentiator the most common mutation has a trafficking defect, but also conducts less chloride. So let's try to put together VX809 and VX770. And again, the results are not really, really exciting. If you can see here, uh, the, the average improvement is 2%. 2% of the lung function. Just mind to what, what's the meaning of this for, for a patient. Almost, almost nothing. So uh, the other problem of uh, this multidrug uh, association was uh, uh, shown by four independent North American leading groups that published these two papers, um, saying that uh, there is a negative interaction with the two molecules. Uh, we also tested in our lab in Verona uh, what was happening. Uh, you can see in this Western analysis that uh, um, this is the immature CFTR, and this is the result of the VX809. It's more or less the same. This is the mature corrected CFTR. It's more or less a faint band. It's uh, this in all the literature. But if you put together VX809 and VX770, this faint band almost disappear in bronchial epithelial cells derived from cystic fibrosis patients. So at this point, uh, um, what, can we, what can we do? I mean, well, the answer is uh, quite simple to say. Let's try to find new correctors and new potentiators. And our story on uh, correctors and potentiators started from a, a library of medicinal plants of the tr tradition of the Bangladesh that Roberto Gambari uh, had. And with Roberto, uh, we were looking at that time, uh, we were looking for anti-inflammatory molecules for CF lung disease. So on, on inflammation, uh, I'm saying 10 years ago. And what we found is that the extract of the plant uh, uh, called eagle marmalos uh, had some interesting anti-inflammatory effect in our model system uh, we have in Verona on bronchial epithelial cells, pseudomonas aeruginosa, and cytokines, and so forth. And uh, what we found also is that within all the different uh, chemicals inside the extract, 
the only chemical that was reproducing the anti-inflammatory effect was this one, that is 5-methoxysoralin or 5-MOP to be quick. And uh, the interesting stuff on 5-MOP uh, that we realized uh, after these uh, results with, with Ilaria, Monica, and Roberto, is that 5-MOP uh, um, is already a drug for people with uh, the chronic inflammatory skin disease termed psoriasis. So the point is that uh, um, all the industrial development uh, for safety of this molecule uh, cannot be abolished uh, going to cystic fibrosis, but can be in any case shortened or maybe made less uh, expensive. So, um, it could have been a good example of drug repurposing or drug repositioning. Uh, the limitation of 5-MOP is that uh, the uh, IC50 is quite high, 10 micromolar, so translating into a drug to be given to people, to, to the 12 patient, is quite too high con concentration. So what we did uh, is to look at uh, a library of uh, the of the friends of 5-MOP. 5-MOP is uh, in the class, in the family of Soralins, and uh, Francisco Dall'Acqua and Adriana Killing ha have a huge library of analogs uh, in the class of Soralin. And what we found is that uh, the angular analog 4-6-4-prime uh, trimethyl angelicin uh, had a, a strong anti-inflammatory effect and uh, the affinity was uh, two orders of magnitude uh, higher than that of uh, 5 MOP, so the IC50 was 100 uh, nanomolar. And uh, to cut a 10 years story short, what we found again of TMA is that uh, besides being an anti-inflammatory molecule in CF models in vitro, it's a corrector of the most common CFTR mutation and the potentiator of the most common uh, CF, um, protein mutated with the f 5 del um, mutation. Uh, this, uh, the point of having a molecule with uh, uh, dual actions, uh, potentiators and correctors, uh, it's not common and uh, for these reasons uh, the molecules has been uh, um, accepted by the uh, European Medicines Agency as an orphan drug for uh, cystic fibrosis, this is in 2013. The mechanism of action of TMA is not very different from that of uh, VX809 from Vortex Pharmaceutical. Um, they stabilize the membrane spanning domain one and actually they bind uh, two residues very, very close. And uh, uh, now we think that uh, TMA is a good prototype molecule uh, and we are working, the, the work is uh, in progress and uh, under revision at this time on different analogs to find more, uh, even more effective uh, molecule for the correction of uh, f 5 del CFTR. Uh, going back again to the other classes of uh, defects, for class 4 defect, uh, the, a defect with uh, a reduced conductance of chloride, what was uh, tried was to uh, apply the, the VX770, the, the strong potentiator, but uh, the results are, again are not, uh, are not uh, exciting. I mean, we should work on this class, class of defect too. And uh, on class five defects, um, uh, those characterized by uh, aberrant splicing, uh, it's all open to um, some drug uh, really uh, up, um, applicable to the patients. I was just to recall this, um, this interesting uh, possibility that, that is open by this uh, preclinical uh, studies uh, by the group of uh, Franco Pagani in Trieste, uh, Mirko Pinotti and Francesco Bernardi here in Ferrara, actually in the same, same department. 
Then class six defect. Uh, sex, class three, six defects is uh, a newcomer. Uh, we know that uh, uh, CFTR protein uh, should be stabilized on the apical member of the epithelial cells by a series of scaffolding proteins that are uh, termed in our jargon the CFTR interactome. And uh, so in some cases uh, the half-life of a CFTR mutate is very, very short. So what can be done is to try to uh, make it more stable on the plasma membrane uh, with two strategies. First of all, let's increase the expression of the mutated protein. And second, let's try to modify the scaffolding proteins and see whether uh, CFTR can be uh, more stable on the plasma membrane. So this is the, the, the synthesis so, of, of, of this strategy. And uh, uh, there are different uh, possibilities that, that are going on with, the, for instance, with the amplifiers of expression of uh, CFTR protein. I just recall uh, uh, one of, uh, of the recent uh, possibilities that has been proposed with an epigenetic approach. If uh, CFTR uh, is uh, downregulated physiologically, uh, by this microRNA, which is under 45.5p, uh, if we block this microRNA, for instance, with peptide nucleic acids that compete with this microRNA, we may decrease the degradation or the uh, inhibition or translation of the CFTR protein, and this has been uh, obtained, and this is the first paper that proves this approach, the next one. Uh, the, the other way uh, is to work on the scaffolding proteins. Um, we know a little bit on, uh, on NERF1. We know that if we increase the expression on NERF1, we increase the amount of uh, mutant CFTR protein on the plasma membrane. So the approach is more or less the same, this work in progress. And uh, the, the approach is to compete and uh, deplete uh, functionally the microRNAs that degrade NERF1, and this seems to, to work uh, uh, quite uh, interestingly, at least in vitro. So uh, the take-home message of the part one of the, of the talk is more or less this one. Uh, the CFDR gene is widely mutated, and mutations are now grouped into six classes of molecular defects, which are molecular targets for innovative therapies. A very effective potentiator is now in use to restore class 3 gating defects. Class 2 trafficking defect is a, a problem. It needs novel optimal correctors, needs an effective multidrug combined therapy with the, other molecules, amplifiers, stabilizers, and, and so forth. We do not have much on class 1, 4, 5, and 6 defects, and this is relevant since uh, it's, we are talking about 20 to 30 percent of CF patients. And uh, another problem for the molecular geneticist is that uh, uh, not all the cystic fibrosis gene mutations are classified in one of the six classes of molecular defect of the protein. So in these cases, uh, patients with uh, some mutations non-classified cannot be targeted with uh, correctors, potentiators, amplifiers. We, we don't know. So we are very much optimistic on, this, uh, on these approaches, and uh, what we can figure out is that uh, in the next few years, uh, we test the genotype of the patient, and this is already done uh, as a routine in the, in the laboratory of genetics and molecular pathology. And so let's say you have this mutation, and I will give you this kind of drug. Great. But no. Sorry, but if you look at the phenotype of the patient, the lung phenotype, the amount of a residual lung function of patients with the same CFTR genotype, 
that are uh, followed by an excellent cystic fibrosis center, Toronto, Canada. So people is uh, committed to be at the best with their care and so forth. You can see that, let, let's make a, a vertical line at age 20 years. You can see here that the lung function, if 100% is, let's say, the average in this room, uh, let's say that some patients have something like 20% lung function, which is, uh, please go rapidly to lung transplantation since you have a, a very severe lung insufficiency. But at the same age, you may have uh, patients with more than the average lung function. I mean, they breathe better than me, than myself. So how can you, how do you explain these huge differences in the lung function in patients that are homozygous for the most common cystic fibrosis mutation? Uh, what the, we think is that, of course, uh, there may be environmental factors there may be patients that don't want to take pills. There may be stochastic uh, um, factors. But uh, strictly speaking, in the genetic terms, uh, what we think is that uh, the CFTR gene causes the disease, but does not explain completely the degrees of expression of the lung phenotype, since there may be other genes uh, that we call cystic fibrosis modifier genes, then can modulate this. And this can be further therapeutic targets for the therapy of cystic fibrosis uh, patients. And uh, there are, there's been a lot of uh, genotype, phenotype association studies uh, to find uh, modifier genes in cystic fibrosis. Uh, I wish just to recall the, the, the most recent um, paper from the International Consortium that takes together North American, Canadian, USA, and European uh, groups. So a lot of patients with a genotype, with a genome-wide uh, um, genotyping and uh, uh, wide uh, transcript, uh, transcriptome expression. And uh, what they say, at least, I mean, what they confirm from previous papers is that the genes of the innate immunity and of the inflammation play a key role in the uh, degree of severity of, of lung disease in cystic fibrosis patients. Now, um, uh, this cartoon is, uh, I know, it's a little bit crowded, but uh, this recalls what happens in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, you have the bronchial epithelial cells here that uh, produce a huge amount of the neutrophilic chemokine interleukin 8 or uh, CXCL8 chemokine and recruit a lot of neutrophils uh, inside the lumen of the bronchi. And all this bunch of neutrophils are not able to clear up completely the bacterial infection, but they produce uh, a lot of damage. First of all, uh, they release DNA uh, since uh, neutrophils release neutrophil extracellular traps as a defense mechanism. They release DNA because of apoptosis and hypoxis necrosis, and this amount of DNA in this side increases the viscosity of the airway surface liquid, worsening what is caused by the basic genetic defect. And secondly, uh, they release proteases, first of all elastase, that damages uh, the lung tissue. And third, they release uh, reactive oxygen species, first of all superoxide anion. Uh, and this also imbalances the, the redox equilibrium on the airway surface liquid and damage uh, the, the bronchial tissue. So what, is, uh, what we think in general is that an exaggerated immune response has long-term negative consequences for the lung of cystic fibrosis patients. But the immune system, of course, has a key role in, uh, in, the, in the defense against uh, the, the bacteria. 
and the complete elimination of the CF immune system is not desirable therapeutic goal. So, in few words, what we want is to reduce but do not abolish the inflammatory response in CF lung. And we started focusing on the on IL-8, the neutrophilic chemokine that is released by bronchial epithelial cells, since uh, uh, this group, uh, um, very well known, is suggesting that uh, patients uh, with cystic fibrosis with uh, reduced expression of interleukin-8 are somewhere protected. They have a better progression of lung disease. They stay better than uh, in general. And uh, we know what, what's happening in the expression of interleukin-8 in bronchial epithelial cells. And uh, we also contributed to, to understand this, uh, this map. And as you can see, there are a lot of uh, kinases, transcription factors, receptors, and, and so forth. You can go to the paper if you want details. So the, there is a, a major problem of redundancy. Uh, I mean that the redundancy in this uh, uh, pro-inflammatory signaling is uh, uh, a great uh, heritage of evolution that makes us more, um, more able to, um, to fight the microorganism. But in pharmacological terms, if you want to stop or reduce somewhere this problem, you don't know whether blocking ec one to you may have a bypass with P38 or junk for instance. So what we thought is to go back again uh, to the patients uh, and uh, try to collect suggestions for the, for the patients with the candidate gene association study to select priorities. So we, we choose this bunch of uh, genes of the innate immunity, uh, 721 SNPs and uh, belonging to 135 genes, more or less tag SNPs. And we tested the association in uh, cystic fibrosis patients on mosaicos for delta F508 mutation with very mild lung disease or very severe lung disease with the help of Mike Knowles and Mitch Trump for that provided DNA and made the clinical classification, and Paolo Gasparini and his collaborators at the University of Trieste for the uh, molecular analysis. We are dealing with molecular analysis of 10 years ago, more or less. So what we found is that on top of the association, we have a phospholipase C beta-3 and a SNP that is uh, uh, coding uh, a non-synonymous SNP that encodes a serine to leucine change in position 845 of the polypeptide chain, and the minor allele, the, the leucine, is associated with mild lung disease in these patients. What about phospholipase C beta? Uh, it's uh, it plays a key role in the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum in the activation of a, a classical calcium-dependent protein kinase isoforms alpha and beta. And uh, very shortly, that you, can, we, you can find the paper here to, to see the details. What we found is that when you silence the expression of PSC beta-3, not only you have a reduced activation of PKC alpha and beta, but most importantly, you have a reduction of IL-8 release. So the hypothesis that PSC beta-3 is in the middle of the transmembrane signaling with a relevant role in Pseudomonas aeruginosa challenged epithelial cells has been confirmed. Then this is just out on the press. Uh, the serine to leucine change is uh, a loss of function. Next. And uh, uh, it is a loss of function since the serine in position 845 is in the hinge of the interaction between the alpha Q subunit that activate PLC beta 3 and PLC beta 3. In other words, uh, PLC beta 3 is not 
activated because of this uh, uh, residue change. Next. So the take-home message on this is that the inhibition of phospholipase C beta-3 reduces IL-8 without shutting down the immune response. This is made possible since uh, we have alternative pathways that are calcium independent in this transmembrane signaling. So we reduce a lot IL-8, but not, but not completely. So uh, as uh, is synthesized in the editorial of, of this last paper, is uh, reduce to have IL-8 enough, but not too much. But if we talk of PLC beta-3, uh, this means that the intracellular calcium homeostasis uh, stands up on the stage. And for instance, in, uh, in uh, just simply buffering uh, uh, cytosolic transients in bronchial epithelial cells in, induced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you have a reduction of the inflammasome and interleukin 1 beta, as uh, shown is one of the many experiments of this paper, uh, led by the group of uh, Paolo Pinton with, with Alessandro Rimessi. Also, if we reduce the entry of uh, calcium inside the cell, uh, looking at the, the, let's say, the refilling channels, like the transient receptor potential anchoring one channels, uh, if you block these channels, uh, you have a reduction of uh, uh, interleukin-8, interleukin-1, beta, and TNF-alpha in, uh, in this model. Again, if you block uh, downstream this signaling, the activation of protein kinase C isoform alpha, uh, you have a reduction of interleukin-8 uh, interleukin release. These have been uh, um, done with uh, beta-cytosterol. And the story is quite funny. Since uh, we started uh, analyzing the black seeds that the Berber pharmacists in Morocco are giving to kids when they have uh, inflammatory diseases of the lungs or inflammatory diseases of the skin. So we went back to the uh, to these black seeds, uh, we looked inside, and then we found that the uh, beta-cytosterol has uh, this anti-inflammatory effect in the model of cystic fibrosis. Uh, beta-cytosterol is also interesting since it's already a drug. I mean, uh, it's uh, phytosterol, uh, and the European uh, Society for Atherosclerosis uh, suggest the use of beta-cytosterol daily to reduce the uh, hypercholesterolemia when statins are too toxic or are not uh, enough. So it's a molecule that is already in the pharmacopoeia and uh, this means that uh, we may think uh, to, to try in cystic fibrosis patients with uh, a simple drug repurposing uh, approach. Uh, Final on, on calcium, uh, CF itself may lead to dysregulation of uh, intracellular calcium homeostasis. Uh, different groups uh, that uh, referred here also again the, the paper of uh, Alessandro and, and Paolo here uh, are saying that different uh, calcium um, channels, uh, pumps, or transporters may be uh, dysregulated uh, in cystic fibrosis cell, I mean in bronchial epithelial cells from cystic fibrosis patients. So, um, to summarize the take-home message of the second part, uh, CF bronchial epithelial cells uh, that are chronically exposed to bacterial infection play a pivotal role in the excessive CF lung inflammation. They are not the only cellular target, but they are very important cellular target. And they may be calcium dysregulated cells in CT fibrosis. The intracellular calcium mobilization in bronchial epithelial cells amplifies CF lung inflammation, intervening on different mechanisms from the release of calcium from the stores to the enteral calcium through triple crack channels. 
and the uh, involvement of the passage from IA to uh, mitochondria. And uh, again, if downmodulation of excessive lung inflammation is a rationale therapeutic option in cystic fibrosis, uh, there could be different cancer regulation, regulators uh, taken into consideration. PSC beta isoforms, trip and crack channels, mitochondria MCU, maybe by screening molecules or better with the drug repurposing approaches. Uh, I have proudly helped and collaborating in setting up uh, this alliance. These are the the main uh, collaborators of, uh, of the results uh, presented here, and I hope that this alliance will be stronger even in the future. And I wish, first of all, uh, to thank the uh, excellent colleagues of the laboratory molecular pathology in, uh, in Verona. First of all, uh, you can see here uh, Cristina De Checchi and uh, Anna Tamanini, and many, many postdoctoral fellows uh, um, we, we saw in, in these 10, 20 years. Uh, here we have Alessandra Sant'Angelo, uh, Carlotta Trabucchi, Deborah Olioso, and Paola Prandini. And uh, for all the external collaborators, I wish, first of all, uh, to thank Roberto, Roberto Gambari, and uh, all uh, his uh, collaborators, Monica, Ilaria, Alessia, Enrica, Nicoletta, Francesca, Eleonora, Giulia, and maybe I am forgetting someone, please forgive me. And uh, the colleagues of the Signal Transduction Lab, Paolo Pinton, Alessandro Rimessi, and Simone Paterniani. And the colleague of the um, Applied Botanics, Gianni Sacchetti, Alessandra Guerini, and Isabetta D'Aversa, that gave an excellent contribution to the beta uh, paper, first of all. Adriana Chilin and Giovanni Barzaro for all the pharmaceutical chemistry in Padova with all the Sorlings, Valeria Casavola and her collaborators for the electrophysiology that was uh, uh, key for uh, the TMA uh, approval, and uh, Marco Prosdocimi and Anita Falezza for all the work they made uh, with the TMA uh, for orphan designation and, uh, and patenting, and uh, you all for your kind attention.